Uh, the Senate Committee on Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs uh, will come to order. Welcome our new, perhaps permanent now, ranking member, but at least in her first year on the committee, she's ranking member today. Nice to see you, Senator Brown. Thank you. Nice to see you. Uh, earlier this month, the world watched in horror as Hamas committed brutal acts of terrorism against the people of Israel. Hamas murdered innocent women and men and children. They attacked teenagers at a music festival. They took hostages, families, kids. All of us are horrified. In the days and weeks that followed, the United States has taken strong, swift actions to support Israel as they defend their country against terrorism and to aid civilians in Gaza. Now it's vital to our national security that we provide critical assistance to Israel, including robust military, economic, and humanitarian aid desperately needed for those harmed by Hamas's terrorism. We must stand with both Ukraine and Israel as they fight back against two of the world's biggest threats, uh, Putin and Iranian-backed terrorists like Hamas. This isn't a time to play politics. We must stand united with our allies. We must defend American interests. We need to confirm key national security nominees who play a critical role in working with their Israeli partners. We've had too many delays already. Right now, politics holds up several key positions. The ambassador to Israel, at least 12, 12 key military personnel that directly impact that part of the world, preventing important work in the Middle East. It's why people think Washington doesn't work. Political grandstanding, especially as we've seen in the House, but way more than that, is hurting Americans, America's ability to effectively protect our interests at home and abroad, keeping talented ambassadors and career military personnel on the sidelines. On this committee, as the ranking member knows, Senator Kennedy knows, Senator Tester knows, we have a long history of keeping politics out and working together to address threats from Russia, North Korea, and China and Iran. In the aftermath of October 7th, we're again confronting a challenge to the civilized world. Our humanity compels us to combat terrorism and to hold state sponsors of terrorism, like Iran, accountable. We must be clear, we must speak with one voice. There's no justification for terrorism, none ever. On this committee, we have a unique role to play, working to understand the financing behind Hamas's attacks so we can work to cut off funding for terrorism at its source and work to prevent future attacks. Iran has an alarming history of supporting terrorist proxies engaged in unspeakable atrocities. It's clear they provide significant funding for the military wing of Hamas. They provide training, they provide capabilities. We'll assess what, we will assess what additional economic tools we need to stop state sponsors of terrorism, including Iran, from supporting Hamas, Hezbollah, Palestinian, Islamic Jihad, and other terrorist proxies. We'll examine multiple terrorist funding streams, including cryptocurrency. We'll consider additional measures to stop the flow of these funds. In response to the brutal and horrific attacks last week, the Treasury Department's Office of Foreign Assets Control imposed additional sanctions on key Hamas terrorist group members, operatives, and financial facilitators located in Gaza and elsewhere, including Sudan and Turkey and Qatar and Algeria. This action specifically targeted those managing assets within a secret Hamas investment portfolio, a Qatar-based financial facilita facilitator with close ties to the Iranian regime, a key Hamas commander in a Gaza-based virtual currency exchange, and its operator. That is not enough. The administration must take additional steps to impose sanctions and dedicate resources toward a multilateral effort to coordinate with allies to track and to freeze and to seize any Hamas-related assets and take steps necessary to deny Hamas terrorists the ability to raise funds. We need to not only identify the bad actors, but identify their money pipeline so we can shut off their funding. We must undertake a more robust, more robust approach to identifying and preventing transactions that take place not only through financial institutions, but also through trade-based money laundering, cryptocurrency transactions, and other channels designed to avoid detection. On this committee, we've raised the alarm about crypto and its role in illicit finance, including the use of crypto to fund terrorists and enable rogue nations financing them. Crypto platforms too often don't use the same common sense protections 
that keep illicit money out of the traditional banking system, safeguards like knowing their customers or suspicious transaction reporting. Some crypto services and tokens even help users keep their transactions anonymous. And when law enforcement attempts to trace or block crypto funds, it becomes a game of whack-a-mole. They stop one transaction and criminals move on to another platform with another alias again and again and again. Terrorists know they can use crypto in ways they can never use dollars. It's why President Trump's Justice Department warned back in 2020 that terrorist groups, including ISIS, Al-Qaeda, and the military arm of Hamas, were raising funds using cryptocurrency. Not surprisingly, after the attack, it was reported that Hamas had raised millions of dollars in crypto to fund their operations. We need to crack down on the use of crypto to fund terrorism and evade sanctions. Last week, Sarah, Senator Warren and I, along with more than 100 of our colleagues of both parties, wrote to the administration to voice concern about these issues. I'm glad the members of this committee, including Senator Reid and Senator Warner, have put forward bipartisan plans for closing gaps around digital assets and our illicit finance uh, rules. These are important steps forward. I welcome more ideas from anybody on this committee and anybody at the witness table and anybody in the audience. Uh, we will work together on this committee in a bipartisan way to make sure terrorists and bad actors can't exploit crypto. This committee and the Senate have a bipartisan history of combating the ways in which Iran threatens the region, not just nuclear weapons development, but also its support for terrorism. There's been a steady drumbeat recognizing the need for the United States and our allies to maintain and ramp up sanctions on Iran's harmful and destabilizing activities. The Senate voted, well, voted overwhelmingly to support the Countering America's adver ad Adversaries Through Sanctions Act to impose sanctions on Iran and North Korea and Russia. We passed the Hezbollah International Finance Prevention Amendment, uh, Amendments Act, which imposed sanctions on Russia, Iran, or any other foreign government supporting Hezbollah. And don't forget this committee acted together, tighten the rules around anonymous shell companies, which too often operate here in the U.S., and which fund criminal syndicates and terrorists alike. We strengthened our money laundering rules and our sanctions tools in a bipartisan way. We will do it again. We need a comprehensive approach to shutting off Iran's funding sources, not just the $6 billion, but the many more billions of dollars Iran uses to continue its destabilizing activities around the world. Now's the time to act. I look forward to working with colleagues on this committee to stem terrorist financing to address the problems posed by crypto and to further strengthen sanctions. Uh, Ranking Member Britt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On behalf of Ranking Member Scott and my fellow Republican colleagues, we'd like to welcome Senator Butler as the newest member of this committee. On October 7th, it's a date that will forever live in infamy. It has been nearly three weeks since Hamas terrorists crossed into Israel to attack our great ally and our friend. Make no mistake, this was an act of pure evil. I just returned from a trip from Saudi Arabia, Israel, and Egypt just this past weekend. I traveled with a bipartisan group of colleagues to send a message loud and clear to the world that the United States of America stands with Israel. We saw firsthand what was truly unimaginable. These barbaric terrorists wore GoPro cameras as they committed these atrocities. So you can watch as babies were decapitated, children shot to death in front of their parents, parents slaughtered in front of their children, young women raped, entire families burned to death, daughters and sons, sisters and brothers kidnapped and taken into Gaza as hostages and human shields. Over 1,400 innocent people were murdered in Israel that day, and more than 200 were taken hostage. The State Department reports that at least 10 Americans remain as hostages and that at least 33 U.S. citizens were killed on October 7th. As we sit here, we know who committed these acts of evil, these acts of terror, Hamas, and we know who funds them and trains them. That's the Iranian regime. That brings me to why we are here today. 
This committee has jurisdiction over our nation's economic national security tools, including sanctions. We must use every tool at our disposal to ensure that those who carried out these attacks and those who financially supported them will never be able to do that again. This committee is also responsible for providing oversight to ensure that every administration enforces the laws that safeguard our national security and the security of our allies. That includes holding the administration accountable when it chooses to waive or neglect those tools. That is why I would like to echo Ranking Member Scott's request that Treasury Secretary Yellen testify before this committee as soon as possible. There is no question that Iran is complicit in supporting Hamas. Remember, evil cannot exist if the good are unafraid. Iran is the world's leading state sponsor of terrorism, providing hundreds of millions of dollars to support organizations like Hamas and Hezbollah, as well as military training, weapons, and munitions. Despite decades of Iranian support for similar atrocities, including those that have killed Americans, the Biden administration has opted to continue the failed policies of appeasement that began during the Obama administration. We all know that money is fungible. Despite the administration's claim that when you release $6 billion to Iran, that frees up an equivalent of $6 billion in other funds to be dedicated somewhere else, such as supporting proxy terrorists in Gaza. The administration should permanently restrict these funds. But since they were recklessly willing to release them in the first place, I urge all of my colleagues here today to support Ranking Member Scott's Revoke Iranian Funding Act, of which I'm an original co-sponsor, and this would take care of it. The administration took actions last week to sanction a number of Hamas operatives and financial facilitators, but it was too little too late for what happened on October 7th. How long has the administration knowed, known about these financiers of terror and yet failed to act? These are answers that we need from Secretary Yellen. The executive branch largely has the tools it needs to sanction state sponsors of terrorism. This administration needs to actually use those tools that are in their toolbox and enforce them. We need to return to a maximum pressure posture towards Iran, imposing bone-crushing, comprehensive sanctions that squeeze Iran financially dry. I also want to address one more important topic about this issue here at home in a literal sense. On college campuses and in cities across the country, including this week in our nation's capital city and even in the halls of Congress, we have seen anti-Semitic protests justifying and even glorifying the actions of Hamas. This is spreading propaganda and it is absolutely unacceptable. I never thought that in the United States of America, in this time, we would struggle to just call evil, evil. The actions of Hamas should not be applauded, celebrated, or praised by any American. They are not only contrary to the core values of our nation, but to every fiber in our being. Remember, the state of Israel was created following the Holocaust so that Jewish people would never have to hide again. But yet that is what we are seeing happen today. And as Americans, we pledged since World War II, never again. Since October 7th, that promise has been under attack both in Israel and here at home. We have a moral obligation to fulfill our promise and that under our watch, never again means never again. And I will wrap up by saying, I have sat in rooms with families whose loved ones are being held hostage twice, both here in the United States and when I was in, when in Israel just a few days ago. You see pictures like this of precious Abigail, three years old, that Hamas is using as a human shield who when you learn her story and the story of the remaining hostages, it will tear your heart out. We must do more. This committee has the power to help ensure this never happens again. This committee has the power to prove that America still knows good from evil. I look forward to hearing from today's witnesses about solutions 
ways that we can work together that will allow the United States to stand shoulder to shoulder with Israel, projecting unwavering American strength to, defer, to deter more hostile aggression and hold accountable both those who carried out these terrorist attacks and those who supported them. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Senator Brett. Uh, in spite of challenges, we will continue uh, to work to, and to do bipartisan work in this committee. Uh, I'll introduce today's witnesses. Dr. Matthew Levitt is the director of the Reinhardt Program on Counterterrorism and Intelligence of Frontier, is a Fromer Wexler Senior Fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. He's authored numerous public, uh, publications on terrorism and illicit finance. Welcome, Dr. Levitt. Ms. Daniel Pletka is a distinguished senior fellow in foreign and defense policy studies at AEI, previously a staff member from Middle East and Southeast Asia for the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations. Welcome back to the Senate, Ms. Pletka. And Dr. Shlomit Wegman is an affiliated scholar at the Harvard Kennedy School and former chair of the Israel Money Laundering and Terror Financing Prohibition Authority. She has extensive experience and expertise in financial regulation digital assets, money laundering, and terrorism financing. Uh, thank you for making the trip to testify here. Uh, Dr. Levitt, you can begin. Chairman Brown, Ranking Mem Member Britt, uh, distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the honor and opportunity to testify before you today. Uh, the bipartisanship I see on this issue is a welcome breath, breath of fresh air. I think we need to recognize that the attack of October 7th was one of the worst acts of international terrorism by any measure including only, if only by measuring the uh, number of American victims that were targeted. Um, as we think about how Hamas is financed, we need to understand a few things. There will be a tendency to try and figure out right now how this attack was financed. There'll be time for that, but I think we need to take a step back. This attack was financed over decades. Hamas has been able to raise funds through multiple means over a long period of time, that's the underlying issue here, not just the money that came in for this particular attack. There have been constants and there have been developments in Hamas's financing over the decades. The constant is Iran, full stop. Iran has funded Ham uh, Hamas since it was founded in late 1987. Generally, a, a continual uptick in funding, even when Hamas and Iran broke uh, over Hamas's refusal to back the Assad regime in Syria, the funding from Iran didn't completely stop. They cut back some of their funding for the political activities, but the funding for the military activities did not stop at all, and pretty soon after, it picked up in full measure. Um, one of the things <clears throat> that is a development, however, is that in 2007, Hamas took over the Gaza Strip by force of arms. Force of arms, it should be noted, not against the Israelis who had already withdrawn, but against fellow Palestinians. When they did that, <clears throat> they created a problem that we just saw an experience with the Islamic State. What happens when a terrorist group controls territory? You're able to tax, you're able to extort, you're able to racketeer, you're able to control borders, you're able to control customs, and you raise a tremendous amount of money. So recently, Hamas's single largest source of income has been control of territory. Probably at least two or three times as much money as they get from Iran. And the US government says that that's at least 70 to $100 million a year from Iran. It's probably somewhere between 300 million and 450 million that they've been able to raise through uh, control of territory. If the Israelis succeed in dislodging Hamas from their governance and military infrastructure project in Gaza, that will be the single most significant way to deny them funds. But it will also remove from Hamas their largest uh, expenses. They will not have to pay teacher salaries and, 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 and collect garbage, so they will need less money to continue terrorism, as we saw with the Islamic State. We're not going to destroy Hamas. We didn't destroy Islamic State, but we can inflict territorial defeat on them, Hamas, as we did with the Islamic State. There are two other primary ways uh, that Hamas has raised money over time. One is abuse of charity. At one point, the largest Muslim charity in the United States was a charity created by Hamas, the Holy Land Foundation for Relief and Development in Richardson, Texas, outside Dallas, designated by Treasury. Later, several of its leaders were convicted on all counts for material support to Hamas. 
There was a period of time when this became less of an issue. It never stopped, but it was less of an issue. Now it is a bigger issue again, and just in the past few weeks, we see the Union of Good, an umbrella organization created by Hamas to oversee Hamas charities, designated by the U.S. Tre Treasury years ago, active again, soliciting funds. We see the revival of Islamic Heritage Society, again, designated charity tied also to Al-Qaeda, based in Kuwait, raising money, millions of dollars for Hamas in the wake of the October 7th attack. We should expect to see more. In fact, after every um, conflict that Hamas has started, we've seen an uptick in funding, including but not only through crypto, and we should anticipate that that will be the case here too. Crypto is an important way of raising funds through crowdfunding, but I think it's an even more important thing in terms of how they move money, which I'll get to in a second. And finally, the Hamas Finance Committee and its investment committees. There have been three Treasury designations about that, as the committee just noted a moment ago. There's a lot to talk about there, in particular the role of Hamas politicians, quote unquote politicians, overseeing these funds. Finally, I'll just say we need to pay as much attention to how terrorist groups like Hamas transfer funds as we do to how they raise funds, and I'm happy to talk about that if there's interest in the questions and answers. And we need to pay attention also not only to the funding, but the resourcing. 70 to $100 million a year from Iran, that's cash. But there's also weapons. Look at all the weapons the Israelis confiscated. Kalashnikovs, RPGs, anti-tank guided missiles. How did those move? How did they get there? I'm interested not only in the cash, but in the resources. At the end of the day, we can do even better than we have done on this target. And I think one thing we're gonna have to do is better balance great power competition and counterterrorism. They're not mutually exclusive. Thank you so much for your time today. Uh, thank you, Dr. Levin. Ms. Pletka, welcome. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator Britt, members of the committee, I'm, I'm honored to be here and I'm honored to be with these two witnesses. Let me score at the outset, underscore at the outset, the, the big money, the big, big money in this terror financing story comes from Iran and specifically from its oil sales. But let's talk for a moment about the, the $6 billion in cash that the Biden administration transferred to Qatar from accounts in South Korea for Iran's use in September. That $6 billion was advertised as payment for the release of five hostages, but it was also widely understood to be the consideration paid for an understanding between the Biden administration and the Iranian regime about its conduct over the coming months. An understanding constructed, of course, to evade congressional review under the terms of the Iran Nuclear Agreement Review Act of 2015. The Biden administration has said that it will not allow the money to be used right now, Qatar has sent mixed signals about whether that is correct or not. Should Qatar defy the wishes of the U.S. government and proceed with a dispersal to Iran, there are steps that you can take. First, it's important for Congress to ascertain whether the government of Qatar has agreed to make Iran whole while it withholds that particular $6 billion from South Korea. In that scenario, Qatar could simply hand over its own cash to Iran and then pay itself back later. Second, if Qatar is actually disbursing the cash from South Korea, focus on the banks. If it chooses to become a financier of the Islamic Republic of Iran, the U.S. government has options under law, as do you. But let's talk about the really big money. Iran's total revenue from oil exports since 2021 is between 81 and $91 billion. Iranian foreign exchange reserves have doubled, growing from $12.4 billion in 2020 to $21 billion in 2023. Since 2021, the estimated value of Tehran's additional oil sales, the difference between its realized revenue and what it would have earned had its exports remained at the maximum pressure level, was 26 to $29 billion. How did that happen? It's simple. The U.S. government allowed it to happen. Iranian oil sales have skyrocketed in the last two and a half years. Why? It's one thing, enforcement. It's no secret that President Biden hoped to re-enter the JCPOA. Simply, the White House, or more accurately, the Treasury Department, stopped imposing serious sanctions on Iranian oil exports. Who was buying it? Mostly the Chinese, although there are plenty of others that I have listed in my testimony. Now, the cost to Iran of supporting its terror proxies is not cheap. In 2018, the Treasury Department pegged Iranian aid to Hezbollah at more than $700 million per annum. 
Hamas reportedly costs Iran about 100 million, but there are other estimates that suggest that it's up to 350 million a year. As Matt suggested, some of that is, is uh, the cost of weaponry. Palestinian Islamic Jihad gets tens of millions. To give you a sense of what happens when Iran has less money at its disposal, during the height of the so-called maximum pressure campaign, transfers to Iran's terrorist proxies dropped dramatically, with Hezbollah he's complaining to, of all places, the Washington Post, about furloughs, cut salaries, and ne necessary withdrawal from Syria, where they were fighting to support the Assad regime. Hezbollah was so strapped for money, it doubled down on the organ trafficking, which also helps it earn. Terrorist groups do have other sources of income. Hamas, as, as Matt said, earns substantial amounts from corruption, from taxes, from holding that territory of Gaza. But senior Hamas officials who are located in both Gaza and Qatar are worth billions. The head of uh, Hamas is worth a, a, an estimated $4 billion. His predecessor is worth an estimated 2 and a half. That's a lot of money. So I want to turn back for a second to Qatar because we don't talk enough about it. What role does it play in the Middle East? It enjoys positioning itself as an entrepot, just a middleman with no real favorites. That is, if I may use a term of art, garbage. Qatar's, Qatar's favorites are the Islamic, Islamist extremist it promotes with its pet TV channel, Al Jazeera. Who lives, who lived in Qatar? The Taliban, Al Qaeda, Hamas. ISIS leaders, all of them cheek by jowl with one of the U.S.'s most important bases in the region, al Udaid. Now is the moment Congress should be asking questions of Qatar. What else should you do? Expose how U.S. assistance to both the West Bank and Gaza is enabling the perpetuation of Hamas rule. Expose how UNRWA, the recipient of almost $6 billion in U.S. assistance since 1950, has aided, nurtured, and fronted for Hamas. Ask why it is that Lebanon, a country ruled by Hezbollah, a beachhead of anti-Israel attacks at its northern border, has been able to skate without a state-sponsored designation. And if I may have about 20 more seconds to finish up. And most importantly, shut down the loopholes in sanctions enforcement that since 2021 have permitted to been permitted to facilitate Iran's accumulation of cash that funds and arms and trains Hamas, Palestinian, Islamic Jihad, Hezbollah, and so many others. Specifically, use the language in existing legislation like INSNA, the Iran-North Korea Sanctions Act, to require that the executive branch notify you of every instance in which it has credible information that there's been a sanctions violation and justify to you its inaction in the case that it doesn't impose sanctions. Second, use the language of CATSA, which the chairman mentioned, to require every waiver of sanctions to be notified to Congress with 30 days notice and put in place expedited procedures for an up or down vote in both chambers on whether to approve or disapprove that waiver. Go after the big money funneled to the terrorists by Iran. Go after the oil sales. Go after the terrorist enablers. That is what fuels the savagery of October 7th. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Wagman, welcome. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman Brown, uh, Senator Bright, and distinguished committee members. I'm honored to be here today and discuss with you terrorism financing. But before getting into the professional uh, aspects, I would like to share with you a personal story the story of two kids from my children's school in Israel, the Green Village. Iftach and Yonatan, 8th and 11th graders from our school, spent the weekend of October 7th in the south of Israel getting ready for a peace festival organized by their father, Aviv, in which they were supposed to set up to the sky dozens of kites to send a message to their neighbor, Palestinian, about peace and coexistence. On Saturday morning, instead of eating their pancakes, a group of terrorists broke into their house, placed all of them in their parents' bedroom, and slaughtered all of them together in their parents' bed. A family of five, three innocent children, two of them went to school with my children, were buried together last week. At the same time, another person, Romy Gonen, a 23 years old student, uh, a nephew of one of my colleagues at the Israeli FinTech Rapid was dancing in a music festival. Um, at that morning, the terrorists started to attack them. She got shot while escaping from the terrorist bullets and kidnapped. There is a voice recording of her hearing her saying that she was got hurt and that they are taking her. She's now kept host is kept being kept hostage in Gaza. 
The Cots family is one of 1,400 people who were brutally slaughtered, burned alive, beheaded, and raped while at their home or the music festival. Romy is part of 2,200 2, um, people from 37 nationalities, including women, children, and elderly, that are held hostage by Hamas in Gaza. Those horrifying stories against civilians seem to be taken directly from ISIL's playbook. And actually, those scripts actually appeared in booklets uh, of guidance that uh, found on, uh, on ground after the attack. And by talking about this attack, I just want to take this opportunity to make it clear, especially in light of uh, the uh, conversations that are now being held over, over campuses in the US, including Harvard University, where I'm located right now, um, that those people are not freedom fighters. Full stop. Freedom fighters do not murder brutally and in purpose, slaughter and rape and all the other things, women, children, and elderly. Those are crucial terrorists who conducted horrible actions toward innocent civilians. And they're also taking very bad actions against their own people as well. So as Hamas adopted, obviously, ISIS practices, we, the global community, should also treat them in a similar manner and impose the full package of financial sanctions over um, Hamas, as was done with respect to Al-Qaeda and ISIS. As we all know, terror organizations cannot exist without funding. Those, activists, th those activities cost a lot of money, and there are many counterparts that fund that. In order to efficiently combat terrorism, we need to cut their oxygen, their funding, exactly like the US did after September 11 and with respect to ISIS. I was asked to focus in this discussion of my testimony today about the field that I'm researching and writing about at Harvard uh, and after leaving the Israeli government and the FATF about cryptocurrencies. And I will answer all your questions on that respect and propose an action plan. But at the same time, I do want to highlight, let's don't lose sight and focus from the big picture. Crypto is currently a very small part of the puzzle. The major funding channels are where and remain State funding, Iran, and others, that, those are the major players. Most of the funds are still being transferred by the traditional channels that we all know from the past. Banks, money transmitter, payment system, hawala, money exchange, trade-based uh, tourism, financing, charity, cash, shell companies, and crypto. The effort should be global and focus on imposing global sanctions on Hamas and their sponsors, as was the case with ISIS. We should ensure that we're doing the right designations and enforcing them, not only, domestic, not only designation by certain countries like the US, the EU, and others, but actually to create a global environment to make sure that all currency and all states are covered. We need to make sure that we have full transparency regarding the involvement of neighboring economies and um, uh, additional measures. As I see that my, my time is about uh, to end, I will save my uh, additional comments to the Q&A session. But uh, I do want to, to highlight that the fight against terrorism financing indeed is a complex and challenging one. But it is a fight that we must win. We must protect our citizens from the threat of terrorism, and we must do it by cutting off the flow of money on terrorism organization. Let's find a way to ensure that those actions will not happen again, not in Israel, and also not in other countries uh, in the world. Thank you so much. Uh, th thank you, Dr. Wegman. Um, before I begin questions, I'd, I'd like to introduce the senator from California, Senator Butler, for her first hearing on, ba on housing, banking, and urban affairs. Welcome. Glad you're here. Uh, Dr. Levitt, I'll start with you. Given the, Iran's role as in funding terrorist groups and the, the array of financing uh, possibilities available to Hamas, uh, two questions about that. What's the most effective terrorist financing measure to restrict funding for Hamas, and does the same apply to Hezbollah? So we're going to need to take a basket of actions regarding Hamas. If there was one thing I could do right now it would be to take the Hezbollah International Finance Prevention Act model and expand it. Somebody explain to me, please, why we only apply secondary sanctions to some foreign terrorist organizations. 
One of the things I think we're already seeing, Treasury officials are going to the Gulf, Treasury officials are going to Europe, and this issue, Hamas financing, is top of the agenda. Expect, anticipate that one of the things they're doing is very firm sanctions diplomacy. I'll give you an example. The most recent Treasury designation of Hamas targets the Finance Committee and the Investment Committee, the, the third round of targets uh, on these issues came this week. <clears throat> it's great, they targeted some important people. It's made a difference. At least one of those people, according to the designation, was still working for a Turkish Hama uh, Hamas front company in Turkey that was designated last time. If sanctions diplomacy alone won't convince, in this case, the Turks to do the right thing, secondary sanctions offer some pretty significant leverage to be able to get that done. The investment committees alone are raising hundreds of millions of dollars for Hamas. It's not all liquid, but it's there. And this is a very important issue, especially as Hamas loses control of territory and we have to look at charity, investments, and Iran. Second, I'm kind of tired of people debating what role did Iran play in this attack. It'll all come out eventually. There was a joint operations committee, their term, not mine, that Iran, Hezbollah, and Hamas have been running in Beirut for at least the last two years. Just yesterday, leaders of these terrorist groups were back meeting with Iranian leaders. Iran has funded, armed, trained, wound up and pointed at Israel, Hamas and other terrorist groups for decades, and we're pretending that we're surprised that Hamas is doing something like this. Iran is ultimately responsible, and therefore it has to, there have to be consequences. Whether it's the six billion, whether it's other things, Iran's ability to finance terrorism has to be dealt with today. And, and the idea of putting these Iran issues in silos, prioritizing only the nuclear program, which is important, don't get me wrong, at the expense of its sponsorship of terrorism and malign activities in the region, well, we saw the consequences. The runt of the Iran threat network, the smallest and least capable of Iran's proxies, just brought the region hopefully just to the brink of regional war. Imagine what Lebanese Hezbollah, the Iraqi Shia militias, the Houthis could do. So the time to act is now. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Wegman, uh, a few years ago, the way terrorist groups exploited crypto was pretty simple. They raised money with Bitcoin. Uh, walk through, if you would, how bad actors innovate and how the and understanding that, uh, as all of you said, one way or another, crypto is not the major source of funding. But talk as, as it's growing and we learn more and more about crypto activities, whether it's drug running or child trafficking or financing terrorism, how are they innovating and how they use crypto? How, how do our legal and technological tools need to evolve so that we can keep up? Thank you very much for the question. So indeed, cryptocurrencies uh, can be um, a par paradise for uh, uh, illicit actors uh, because they preserve some sort of anonymity and, and, uh, and, and coverage. Um, in order to combat that, the international community via the Financial Action Task Force, the FATF, established a toolbox in order to um, be able to trace that. So now we, are, um, um, we have uh, those standards. We're actually enforcing a set of rules in order to follow those activities and those actions. Um, we see that there is a major impact for that rules, and I could elaborate that on that a little bit later. But we, at the same time, we do see that bad actors are trying to avoid that. Um, and one of the, uh, with respect, if we'll speak a little bit about Hamas, we see that there are two channels in which they're using that. First, to, uh, to, for fundraising uh, from you know, the public, doing crowdsourcing and so forth. And another way is to transfer funds between the organizations. However, as I mentioned, this is not uh, a large part of their budget, uh, but there is a tendency that it may grow in the future. Um, the overall package uh, of potential uh, regulation, or not potential, the inf uh, actual regulation that is already enforced in many countries, uh, proven to be very effective. Law enforcement community developed uh, tools to investigate that, trace that, and follow that. And for example, the Israeli authorities were able to uh, seize and, and freeze about um, uh, $7 million from Hamas in fundraising uh, campaign that they ran. So this is one of the examples on how we could actually trace that. Uh, we see many, many organizations around the world that are still trying to work on that. There are early adapters to some extent, uh, but like any other field of terrorism financing and, and um, money laundering, this is uh, a game you know, between the good guys and bad guys. Thank you. Well, Senator Britt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And on behalf of the ranking member and my Republican colleague, Senator Butler, we want to welcome you to your first banking committee hearing today. 
Um, as I mentioned, having just returned from Israel and seeing the evil uh, that Hamas is firsthand, uh, I, along with my colleagues that went, a bipartisan delegation are more committed now than ever to making sure that we look at every single opportunity to cut off funding to Iran and to end all of this once and for all. Uh, Mr. Levat, you said, and, and you've served in various roles, obviously, when it comes to you know counterterrorism and financial intelligence and both Secretary of um, at State Department and their Treasury. I'd like to know, given your experience in this space, um, can you tell us, you talked about both the raising of money by Hamas and the transfer of money. I want to focus on the transfer. Tell me, practically speaking, how that works from money going from Iran to Hamas or Hezbollah. Thank you for the question. There are multiple ways that Iran transfers money. First of all, it's able to fly money and goods to Syria, transfer them physically to Hezbollah, and then be able to transfer them on by trade-based money laundering, by hawaladars, by money exchange houses, uh, trade-based money laundering uh, into the West Bank or the Gaza Strip. We've even seen um, uh, Iran and Hezbollah do things like deposit money into a third person's account, who's not actually a Hamas member, maybe their you know, wife's hairdresser. Um, but you know, when Hamas says do that, you're not really in a position to say no. We've seen them send people with credit cards. Um, and so there's multiple ways to move the money. So when you look at these multiple ways, if you were to just give an estimate of the percentage of Hamas and Hezbollah, um, their total revenue that comes from Iran, what would that number be? What would that percentage be? The number that the U.S. government has been using, and this is money, not mm -hmm. other things, so it's total more, is about $100 million, uh, for Hamas, mm -hmm. fluctuating between 70 and maybe 120, probably at the higher end recently, and $700 million to $1 billion uh, for Hezbollah, much, much larger budget. So on the percentage-wise, though, if you were to kind of sort of take the, the total the total picture there, what, what, what number would you give that? For Hezbollah, yep. it's a significant, nobody knows is, they, is a simple answer. For Hezbollah, it's the overwhelming majority. Okay, um, 90%? They have their own. I've heard on the ground maybe 90% of their funding comes from Iran. It's possible. Hezbollah has mm -hmm. its own independent illicit financial streams, which are significant, probably less than 90, but it's a lot, a lot. and it's constant. So uh, I want to shift gears just a little bit. Um, obviously, the, this administration, with regards to not enforcing Iran's sanctions on the oil trade with countries like China, Russia, Venezuela, allowing Iran to profit over about $80 billion um, since uh, President Biden took office. I, th I think without question, the Iranian regime has used this $80 billion in profits for a number of illicit activities, most of which we, a lot of which we are talking about here today. So uh, with adversaries like China, when they're unwilling to, they just disregard U.S. sanctions and the Iranian regime, regime directly benefits, I believe it's totally and completely unacceptable. Um, my question to you is, what can we do better as a nation looking back to stop this? What has the U.S. not done? And, and also, Mrs. Pletka, I'd like for you to answer this. Uh, what are we not doing from a U.S. perspective that we should be doing right now to, to stop this? Go ahead, Mr. Levet. Uh, so, first of all, as I said earlier, we need to spend more time paying attention to how they transfer the funds, because there are things we can do to frustrate their efforts. That's important because at the end of the day, for all these billions, mm -hmm. Iran is able to prioritize a billion, a billion bit, even under maximum pressure, they were financing Hamas and Hezbollah. Second, we need to do more to target this income that Iran has because it uses so much of its income to finance not only Hamas and Hezbollah, but Houthis and, and Shia militias too. Absolutely, and I'm so sorry I'm running out of time. Mrs. Pletka, can, do you mind um, speaking directly to that and what more the U.S. can do to crack down on these sanction violations? We can crack down on the sanctions violations. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> that's, that's what's not happening. What we've done in the last uh, two and a half years is we've, uh, there have been absolutely sanctions imposed, a lot of sanctions imposed on Iran. But in the oil sector, they've mostly been small ball. We've gone after okay. small traders. We need to go after the big purchasers, especially the Chinese, but India, Russia, and others. There are, we, ha we do actually have leverage in the form of secondary sanctions, trade, and other tools at our disposal. And lastly, I'm running out of time, but you spoke specifically about loopholes that are being used. Can you speak into that so that we can know what we need to be doing differently? 
As the chairman noted, um, uh, I used to be a congressional staffer, so I pay a lot of attention to legislation. The problem in a lot of legislation is that it doesn't force action. In other words, it doesn't force the executive branch, Republican, Democrat, Martians, whatever they are, into doing something once they know. There are no good triggers in a whole series of important pieces of legislation, but that model exists in the Iran North Korea Sanctions Act, which is when you see it, you must notify you. And then you must tell us what you have done, and if you have done nothing, you must tell us why. That is a loophole big enough to drive billions of dollars of earnings for Iran through that then goes to our friends, the terrorists. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Senator Britt. Senator Reid of Rhode Island is recognized. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And like uh, Senator Britt, I had the uh, opportunity to travel to Israel and the region last weekend and the horrific events of the last several days uh, have really, I think, uh, focused the whole world on how we can disrupt and dis degrade these terrorist organizations. Mr. Love it. Uh, one point I think you made, though, is even under the maximum pressure campaign of President Trump, Iran was still funding these organizations at a robust level. Is that accurate? It is. It's not. A, I'm not. It's not pointing a finger at any one administration. Right. But the fact is, the numbers of 100 million to Hamas and 700 million to a billion to Hezbollah were numbers that came out in the Trump administration. And because Iran doesn't care about its citizenry and doesn't prioritize it, it doesn't matter if people are freezing in a, in a cold winter and don't have gas for their homes, right. they're gonna prioritize. And because Iran is a big economy, even under sanction, it, it, can, it can do this. Right. Um, but that uh, has to be considered when we think about imposing sanctions on Iran, because in fact, what they do is deprive, as you said, their own people of basic necessities in order to keep funding these revolutionary movements and their, their view. Is that fair? At the end of the day, Iran has to be held responsible for its significant role in these heinous attacks. Some of that's gonna have to be sanctions. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I agree. One of the issues, I think, is because of the proximity and also the controls that the State of Israel have on Gaza, particularly, and Hamas, is what role uh, can we play with Israel to effectively interrupt uh, the flow of resources, weapons, or material to Hamas? I really appreciate that question because I think this is gonna, something that's going to get needs to get a lot more attention. How did all those weapons that Hamas just used get in? There's going to have to be a more robust maritime uh, effort. There's going to have to be more robust surveillance of what goes into Syria. It can't be all on the Israelis to do airstrikes targeting Iranian mm -hmm. uh, weapons supplies to Hezbollah in particular. Uh, th th we failed here. All of us failed here. When you look at the weapons that got in, and we're going to have to do better, mm -hmm. we, U.S. has unique capabilities here, and I think the administration has been very, very clear that it intends to use them to help Israel. And uh, th this would be a collaborative effort, but uh, both the world community and Israel has to focus on these networks by th both covert and overt means, so tracking bank accounts, et cetera. But uh, I think, frankly, this was an area that we all missed, you know, that we all we tolerated in that we knew this money was going into Hamas, but there was no preemptive action by, by any of the major powers. Is that fair? Or? There was a lot that was missed, but there was also a major policy error by everybody involved mm -hmm. on the calculation that Hamas was deterred, and that so long as money went in for salaries, it's not just that we n knew it, we encouraged it. The Israelis encouraged it yeah. uh, so that there would be calm in Gaza. That calculation failed miserably yeah. Yeah. and is going to have to be revisited. No, I think you're absolutely right. I think there was a perception that uh, Hamas had become uh, just another sort of organized crime operation with no... Uh, plans to, serious plans to attack Israel, and as long as we paid them off, we'd be okay. Is that, that's a little bit vernacular, but I think that sense has some relevance. So I think it's spot on, and I can't reiterate enough 
Hamas didn't attack because of occupation. Hamas didn't attack because there's no two-state solution. Hamas is dead set against a two-state solution or any solution that would have anything but an Islamist state and no Israel. No, I, I, again, I think uh, Hamas hates Israel and has no regard for the Palestinians either. That they're pawns in their operations and we have to recognize that as well as their uh, profound hatred of Israel and the, and the state of Israel. Uh, Dr. Wagman, um, one of the things that we've been working on with my colleagues, uh, Senator Warner and Senator Rounds and Senator Romney, is the legislation uh, that would go after the uh, intermediaries, the decentralized financed arrangements. Uh, could you comment very briefly, I'm running out of time, about that? Yeah, sure. So in order to, um, uh, to uh, confront the threat of this technology, like any other technology, it can be used in many different ways. A toolbox should be developed and actually have been developed and should be continued developing in order to be able to do some uh, tracing and to have some uh, uh, accountable parts to, that will be able to identify the bad actors that are going there. Because most of the activities is going over the blockchain and there is a lot of transparency, we could actually use this technology in order to trace uh, the bad actors. One of the things that we've recently seen is that Hamas stopped uh, its fundraising through Bitcoin because the Israeli authorities were able to trace that. And perhaps to add to that, it's not only the intelligence community that is uh, able to do that, but here, because everything is transparent, we could do a lot of work uh, by the private sector. And we see a lot of crowdsourcing activities of people that are actually go after and try to find those networks and then report that to um, um, the authorities. So that's a very interesting balance that changed um, in intelligence uh, communities. Thank you very much. Uh, I, just for the record, the bill number is S2355. So I ask for support. Thank you, Senator Reid. Uh, Senator Tillis from North Carolina is online, I think, from his office. Uh, thank you, Chairman, and, and thanks to the panel for uh, being with us today. Uh, Ms. Pletka, I wanted to talk a little bit more, drill down a little bit more, based on your opening statement about the complex web through which Iran funds uh, terrorist operations, including Hamas and Hezbollah. Uh, but I, I'd like to shift a, a bit more towards Qatar. Um, uh, we know that they provide aid. We know that money is fungible. Can you tell me any, if you have any information available for the for the committee, give me an idea of what we should be concerned with in terms of those money flows and with, with money being fungible, being used for malign purposes versus the purposes originally intended? Thank you for the question. So uh, I think as, as, uh, as Dr. Levitt mentioned, part of the challenge here is that Qatar plays a double role. The uh, first is a helpful interlocutor, the neutral, uh, a neutral government that provides money to Hamas to take the pressure off, something that the Israelis and the Americans and others uh, have long been aware of. The problem is that uh, first of all, this arrangement, deeply, deeply Faustian deal that ended up uh, helping Hamas uh, gather the money necessary to do what it did on October 7th. So, but there we, blame, there's blame to go around. But the broader problem is that Qatar is a home, a, a home for terrorists, a home for terrorist money. Uh, it is a place where Ismail Haniyeh, the, uh, the head of Hamas, lives in enormous wealth, $4 billion. Yes, part of that is in real estate in Gaza, part of that is in real estate elsewhere, part of that is in villas. This cannot be. We cannot have, on the one hand, a U.S. base and a nominal friend who is also, who also presents a homeland for every single terrorist group that, by the way, has been responsible not simply for the murder of Israelis, not simply for the murder of Americans in Israel, but responsible for the murder of Americans in Iraq, responsible for the murder of Americans all around the world. This is the challenge. And my most important priority here is to ask the question, what are they doing? How are they doing it? Are they providing financial flows to Hamas outside the arrangements they made? Of course they are. Are they providing financial arrangements to ISIS and to Hezbollah, as has been alleged in years past? 
Probably. They have unique influence with those groups, and unique influence doesn't just come from being a nice guy in the Middle East. Yeah, and honestly, I think the answer, I think you've answered those questions. I believe probably that you are correct, and we need to get to the bottom. I, I want to talk a little bit about the Biden administration, where I, I am at odds with their Middle East strategy and the assumption that Iran is irrational and, and could potentially be a good faith actor. Um, I, I don't see any logic behind that. And uh, I think it was that logic that led, at least initially, to the $6 billion that was going to be released to Iran. So does anything, and Ms. Plutka, this is for you or anyone on the uh, panel that may want to answer, does anything lead you all to believe that having that posture from this administration is productive uh, and, and uh, um, has any foundation or justification? And Ms. Plutko, we'll start with you, but I, I'm just trying to get why, why we would think that Iran uh, has any role to play in de-escalating the tensions in the Middle East based on their past behavior. Well, this was a conceit of the Obama administration that, in fact, if we could get Iran to uh, uh, step away from its uh, aggressive nuclear weapons program, that they would uh, eventually evolve into a more constructive player in the region. The reverse has been true. I don't think there's any reason on earth after Iran has armed the Hashdashabi, the popular mobilization units in Iraq, Hezbollah in, uh, in Lebanon, the Houthis in Syria, Hamas, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, and numerous other groups. There's no reason to believe why Iran has a constructive role to play in any sense. And don't let's not forget, please, uh, we talk about what Iran does to these countries, how Iran has been responsible for the death of Americans and Israelis. Let's not forget what Iran does to its own people. Mahsa Amini was a great cause for us last year. Last week, they murdered another 16-year-old girl for exactly the same reason. This is an execrable regime. I'm going to leave a second for you, Matt. Yeah, Mr. Chair, what, what I, uh, if I may, because I want to be mindful of time, if, if anyone on the panel disagrees with the position that I've taken or, or the, uh, the response from Ms. Plotka, I'd like to give them equal time. You know, well, anyway. Thank you so much for the question. I'm, I'm too smart a man to disagree with Daniel Pletka publicly. Uh, but I do think, uh, at least in my conversations with administration officials, I've, I've yet to hear anybody use that type of language. I don't know anybody in the Biden administration who thinks Iran has a constructive role to play. I think there were then, people who maybe think- Perhaps you could get to why we would actually, well, we know that the mistakes of the, of the, uh, the Obama administration, but why we would even put $6 billion on the table if, if in fact that's not true? I think the $6 billion, uh, which I had problems with, was entirely about securing the release of American citizens. And if someone else had a better idea for how to secure the release of these Americans, I'd be all ears. Giving Iran $6 billion was extremely uncomfortable, but I think it wasn't in a vacuum. We were trying to secure the release of Americans, which is a national priority. It is money being fungible, it, it could be those very dollars that now have t some 200 people being held hostage by Hamas. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Senator. Thank Senator Menendez of New Jersey is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, through Iran's funding of terrorist organizations, it continues to work towards the delegitimization of Israel. Uh, Iran has to be held accountable for its role in funding Hamas and other terrorist groups. And while I applaud the Treasury Department's recent sanctions on individuals identified as key Hamas terrorist group members, operatives, and financial facilitators, much, much more has to be done to prevent malign actors like Iran from financing proxy terrorist groups. Ms. Plutka, in a recent article, you wrote that the United States has chosen not to enforce its sanctions on Iran. It's cer certainly bothersome to me since I was the uh, architect and author of most of those sanctions. What, what do you mean by that? And what recommendations do you have for the U.S. to do better uh, enforcement of existing sanctions? Thank you, sir. Um, and Menendez-Kirk is great legislation. Mm -hmm. So thank you for your leadership on that. Um, as I said in my opening testimony, I think there's a lot uh, that Congress can do to, um, to tighten the screws. Why do I think the administration is not enforcing sanctions? Um, there is a hope, there has been a hope, that, um, that, that the United States could um, either modernize or reenter the JCPOA as it was if it was able to secure Iranian cooperation. 
Um, to me, that's fantasy land, uh, but it certainly represented the ambition. At the beginning of the administration, I hope uh, it is no longer. What can you do? First of all, uh, we, need to, we need to go after everything, and that, I think, has been the message from the entire table. We need to go after all spigots that are funding Iran and enabling Iran to fund its proxies around the region. That means oil sales. It means every other activity that the Iranians are involved in. We see these illicit oil sales. We also see, by the way, illegal transfers between Russia and Iran exchanging grain for oil. All of these are opportunities. We have task forces in the Persian Gulf that can be used to interdict ships. We have options at our fingertips to deny even ships on the high seas insurance, to go after them in a whole variety of ways. But the most important thing is to impose a cost on the buyers. They are the ones helping Iran fund these groups, and most importantly, in that group is the Chinese government, the communist Chinese government in Beijing. Yeah, and that is a that is an issue I've raised before, which is the Chinese are buying enormous amounts uh, of Iranian oil and, uh, uh, and Russian uh, as well. And so at the end of the day, you have to make a conscious decision. If you really want to sanction and stop the flow of money, you have to pursue, as you suggest, the buyer. Uh, because without a buyer, there isn't a flow of money at, at the end of the day. Uh, in September, uh, you know, uh, the U.S. agreed that it would unfreeze $6 billion in Iranian funds. However, in light of Hamas's attack on Israel, the U.S. and the Qatari government have agreed to temporarily prevent Iran from obtaining access to the $6 billion. It seems to me that the goal of any sanctions regime is to use economic leverage to bring about changes in a foreign actor's uh, behavior. With that said, Iran is uh, obviously openly hostile towards Israel. It supports Hamas, and while it denies that it assisted Hamas' uh, terrorist attack against Israel, Hamas doesn't have the intelligence and technological capabilities to launch such an operation. That can only come from a state actor, and the only state actor who would help Iran, uh, uh, who would help Hamas is Iran. Uh, Dr. Wegman, shouldn't one of the conditions for unfreezing the $6 billion uh, is uh, the cutting of all ties uh, by Iran uh, to Hamas and its flow of money to it? Um, thank you uh, for, for the question. Uh, I'm not um, um, uh, fully um, uh, familiar with the, with the U.S. Uh, policy and approach in those aspects, but obviously I, I would say that. Obviously, Iran is financing uh, Hamas, and uh, I do believe that any action that can prevent that should be um, um, should be taken. Anything that stops the funding to Hamas. Well, it, it just seems to me, uh, and of course, we always want to get American citizens back. But it brings a larger question: uh, We should not let American citizens travel to countries where they are likely to be hostages, i.e., Iran, Russia, and others, because then we are put in ourselves in a hostage situation. Uh, but uh, it also, I think, encourages other countries to say, if you detain Americans uh, illegally, uh, then you can hit a cache of, uh, of gold. And that is something that we just simply should not allow. Thank you. Senator Kennedy of Louisiana is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Levitt. Um, Hamas runs Gaza, is that correct? Yes, sir. And lots, lots of people help Hamas, don't they? There are people who help. There are lots of people in Gaza who oppose Hamas as well. Well, Qatar sends uh, Hamas uh, $10 million a month to run the place, does it not? It has. Um, the Palestinian Authority which the people of Gaza rejected in favor of Hamas, uh, pays Gaza's electricity bill. They keep the lights on for, for uh, Hamas, don't they? Well, well, to be clear, the people of Gaza didn't reject the Palestinian Authority. Hamas took over want, with want, force of arms. I don't want to debate that. Yeah. Uh, There's not much to debate. Yes, the there, Palestinian Authority yeah, does yeah, provide yeah, salaries yes. to its people in Gaza. Does the Palestinian Authority pay for the ki keeping the lights on in, uh, in Gaza? They pay for some of it, yes. 
Um, the UN sends, uh, sends uh, Hamas money to uh, educate the children, does it not? The UN pays for some education uh, in Gaza. They do that, that through their yes? own agencies. Is that a yes? They provide the money into Gaza, yes. I'll, I'll take that as a yes. Um, the UN gives Hamas money to run hospitals, does it not? The UN runs hospitals in Gaza too, right. yes. And in fact, doesn't Hamas ta tax uh, at the rate of 16.5% every bit of food and aid that comes in to, uh, to Gaza? They do tax everything. I don't know the exact and percent. Hamas char uh, levies a, a, a tax on even fish caught, does it not? They tax everything. And Hamas also levels a, an income tax, does it not? That too. Okay. Um, President Biden's administration has not enforced the sanctions on Iranian oil, on, uh, 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 on Iranian oil, has it? No. Okay. So you agree with Ms. I'm sorry, I can't see you. Pletka. Pletka. So you agree? I tend to make it a policy to try to agree with Ms. Pletka whenever possible. Yeah. Um, well, you're smart. You, you told us you were smart. Um, President Biden has not chosen to impose the, uh, the snapback sanctions under the JPCOA, has he? Correct. Okay. Um, Ms. Pletka, who has the $6 billion? It's in a bank in Qatar. Okay. So Qatar has control of it. In essence, that is correct, although... Well, let me put it this way. If the, if the Qatar bank... There's a Qatar bank. If the Qatar tells them to do something, and the United States tells them not to do something, who's the bank going to listen to? Well, that's the, that is the question before who's us right now. Who's the bank going to listen to? In Qatar, the, of their course. government. Okay. And isn't it a fact that back in 2021, Treasury Yellen, through uh, special drawing rights at the International Monetary Fund, gave... Uh, Iran, four and a half billion dollars? That's what I understand, yes. And she'd like to give them more. That's what I understand, yes. That's like cash money. It's really a dividend. You can cash in for U.S. dollars. Is that right? Uh, th that's what I understand. Wow. It seems to me that we could, we, we could cut off Hamas or at least to go, go a long way toward doing that by actually just enforcing the things that we already say we're enforcing. Every authority that is necessary to cut off Iran, Hamas, and every other terrorist group is already in the president's hands. The question is never whether the president can, it's whether the president will. Well, why has the Biden administration been so soft on Iran? If we know Iran is funding Hezbollah, Hamas, the Houthis, the, the, uh, the, 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 their surrogates in Syria, their surrogates in Iraq, why has President Biden's administration been so soft on them? Well, do, they just, do they just think love is the answer and, and that, that, that this isn't a bar fight? And that, I mean, it just looks to me like this administration is quoting Socrates in the middle of a prison riot. That's a very apt uh, picture. I, I'm, not a, I'm, I'm not a spokesman for the Biden administration, so I can only give you my estimation. There has always been a problem in our compartmentalization in dealing with Iran. We have prioritized their nuclear program, their nuclear weapons program, understandably, but we have not ignored, but diminished the importance of their support for terrorism, their regional disruptions, and their human rights record. Those things need to change. We need to tighten the screws on Iran in every single aspect. Peace through weakness never works, does it? No. Thank you, Senator Kennedy. Uh, Senator Cortez Masto is from Nevada is recognized. Thank you. Uh, thank you, <clears throat> Mr. Chair and the ranking member. Thank you for the panelists as well. Uh, this really requires us to work in a bipartisan way without gotcha moments, and, and, and I appreciate the discussion today. Uh, but I do think that it, let's be candid and at the same time uh, tell the facts. 
uh, we're, we're concerned about previous actions as they led to where we are today, uh, and then how we address moving forward, working together. Uh, if I recall in 2018, it was the Trump administration that pulled us out of the JCPOA. It was the Trump administration who it refused to impose sanctions under Katza. So there's enough blame to go around. But let's, let's focus on where we are today, because I think this is where we should be and what we need to do. Uh, and let me just start uh, with, with the first question. Um, I think what I've been hearing and I've been listening this morning um, as well as uh, to the conversation uh, from the panelists, and thank you, very esteemed panelists, we all agree that we need to make sure that Israel has the support it needs to defend it against the threats posted by Hamas and other terrorist organizations. I'm also concerned about the threat against, by uh, Hezbollah that it continues to pose against Israel's security. Uh, we all know, and we are hearing from all of you, uh, much of the support comes from Iran's state sponsorship of terrorism of Hezbollah, Hamas, and, uh, and uh, uh, the like. I also recognize that Hezbollah and Hamas uh, still re receive funding from private donations and organized crime syndicates across the globe. My question to all of you is, how can and is the administration working with our European allies uh, to really crack down on the illegal funding of terrorist organizations like Hamas, like Hezbollah, like we've been talking about? How do we, what, what is it that we is happening with our European allies uh, and what more should we be doing? And maybe Mr. Levitt, I'll start with you. Thank you so much. The Deputy Secretary of the Treasury is uh, about to take off for Europe on this exact issue. And so you're seeing top level engagement on this issue in general and specifically on the issue of Hamas, which traditionally hasn't gotten as much traction with our foreign partners, including the Europeans, um, who have seen Hamas as a lesser threat, uh, not a threat to the international community, just to Israel. The October 7th attack was one of the worst acts of international terrorism ever, number of countries that were affected, number of people killed, number of people wounded, number of people kidnapped. Um, and so there's an opportunity now to see Hamas for what it is and to get better buy-in and activity. When the president of France goes to Israel and says, the counter-ISIS coalition should take on the job of countering Hamas, that's not likely to happen, but a coalition of its own to get together and do more, in particular on the financing, is a very smart idea. Whether it happens or not, when the president of France says this, not someone who's typically been so hard on Hamas, that's a big step forward. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, I'm happy to, to respond. Uh, I do think the coalition against Hamas is required like was done with ISIS. And I think that there are many tools that have not been used so far. First, to have a global designation on Hamas as a terror organization as was done uh, on ISIL, meaning that all countries will have to impose that in all currencies, not only in US dollars and or, e or euro. In addition, we need to make sure that the secondary sanctions are being imposed. For example, we do see it's, it's, uh, it's known uh, intelligence that Turkish exchanges and banks are constantly working in order to support Hamas, and the world is just putting you know, blind eye on that. Uh, another thing is to make sure that we have an, an, um, enough transparency on the economies of the, of the region. For example, Lebanon is hosting or is uh, having internally uh, Hezbollah. We haven't seen report, uh, for example, by FATF that actually doing the analysis of how to treat the Lebanonian economy and what should be done in order to make sure that Hezbollah does not control it or use that in order to do those actions. And last but not least, also the Palestinian authorities had never been evaluated by FATF uh, in order to check what is going on on the financial si uh, system of the Palestinian Authority, and this should be examined so we'll better understand the uh, uh, relationship between uh, the economies of Gaza and the rest of the Palestinian authorities, and it actually also answer previous uh, questions about how do we know where the funds are going. If we don't know what happens in the Palestinian Authority economy in general, we will never know what's actually going in practice. And I only have a few seconds left, but you touched on something that was the next question, was Turkey. Because we also know where uh, everyone basically say to Hamas, they're not terrorists. So, so how do we address uh, and, uh, the concerns that you brought up, which was my question, is how do we address the terrorist financing that pot potentially may be going through that country? So I think that after the event of, of this month, um, no question mark should be uh, still be in the air. This is pure terrorism, and, if, and this is why we need you know the international pressure. If that's not was not clear until now. Thank you. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Cortez Masto, uh, Senator Haggerty of Tennessee is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, 
There's been a lot of discussion among members of Congress about the role of cryptocurrencies in funding the recent attack on Israel that was carried out by Iran backed Hamas. Policymakers that are hostile to cryptocurrency have even gone so far as to suggest that by eradicating the crypto industry, perhaps the attack would never have happened. I find that amazing to hear, but uh, that's, that's some of the claims. I'd like to provide some context to these claims. The Wall Street Journal recently reported that Hamas and Palestine Islamic Jihad since 2021 have received roughly $130 million in crypto financing via offshore exchanges and platforms like Binance. It's important to note that these figures are disputed and per independent analysis that was released just this week could be overestimated by as much as 99%. The data analytics firm cited in this Wall Street Journal report has even disputed the estimates that were reported, stating that there is no evidence to suggest that Hamas fundraised anything close to this $130 million reported. Make no mistake, any such funding is unconscionable and should be addressed in a thoughtful, targeted way in order to choke off these terrorists. But we should do this without pushing the crypto industry overseas. In this case, we need a scalpel, not a sledgehammer. What seems to be lost in the discussion is the billions of dollars, I'm talking about billions with a B, that have been funneled to these very organizations we're concerned about, or that's their principal sponsor, Iran, with the blessing of the Biden administration. Until recently, this appeasement policy was led by special envoy for Iran, Rob Malley. Rob Malley, who's had his classified security clearances ripped away, who's been kicked out of the State Department, and whose team included at least one person who it's been reported is a member of the Iranian Experts Initiative, which is a foreign influence and collusion network that's run by the Iranian regime. Biden's lax sanctions enforcement on Iranian crude sales have allowed the terrorist regime's oil revenues to surge from $7.9 billion during the final year of the Trump maximum pressure campaign. I might add that the secondary sanctions I was involved in imposing in that administration worked from $7.9 billion in the final year of the Trump administration to more than $42 billion in 2022. According to estimates, the Iranian regime has been able to amass up to $91 billion in illicit oil revenue since the Biden administration came into office. President Biden's also greenlighted a $10 billion payment from Iraq to Iran for electricity. Further, President Biden has sent UNRWA over $730 million UNRWA nominally provides direct relief and work, works programs for Palestinian refugees in Gaza and the West Bank, but these funds are fungible. And UNRWA has an abhorrent track record of supporting anti-Semitic curricular that refer to Israel as the enemy and teach math. I'm not making this up. They teach math by counting martyred terrorists. I've seen the materials. At the same time, Qatar has over the past decade provided more than $2 billion in fungible economic and humanitarian aid. So my first question is a simple one, Dr. Wagman. Is tens of billions of dollars in Iranian oil revenue and sanctions relief from this administration, plus whatever direct monetary relief to Hamas-controlled Gaza that has flowed that way, is that in any way comparable to the $130 million that allegedly has flowed through, which is probably overstated from the crypto markets? Yeah, so as I mentioned, I mean, uh, crypto right now is not the main um, uh, source of funding for Hamas, uh, but definitely the old traditional ways in which we see that state funding is the most uh, dominant uh, thing that is uh, funneling into um, um, the Gaza Strip from cash. Uh, let, trade let, let me follow up on that. Is it yeah. fair to say then that these oil revenues, the sanctions relief and the direct monetary relief revenue streams have done far more than any crypto financing to either directly support these terror groups or to build up the resources that they could then divert to other malign activities? Generally speaking, the funding of Hamas comes from state funding in many different channels. It goes through um, a Turkey, to uh, money exchanges, through trade-based uh, tourism financing, cash that are be is being sent, banking system, underground banking, many variety of ways. Yep. Crypto is only one of them, and it's a, um, um, right now it's a limited part. Point being that we brought those revenues down dramatically, the maximum pressure campaign. They've skyrocketed because of non-enforcement of sanctions. And what seems to be happening here is that we're trying to divert attention from that fact, attacking an industry that we should be moving onshore. We want to have, actually have control and, and, and promote it and be able to, to deal with it. Instead, pushing it offshore strikes me as, as, as a very bad idea. Dr. Wagman, one last question. Do you agree that international entities are harder to work with to combat these illicit flows? Would providing clarity to the crypto industry and encouraging these companies to move 
to the United States and within our jurisdiction rather than forcing them offshore not be a more straightforward way to reduce these illicit flows? Sorry, I think that having a global regime is extremely important in order to make sure that there are no weakest link because you could impose whatever you want internally, but then everything is being pushed away to other jurisdictions. So you have to have it both internally and internationally. And with that respect, we do see that there are, the weakest link is in other countries that did not uh, uh, enforce FATF regulation. And I do think that the U.S. can push very strongly the FATF in asking it to actually publish great list of countries and jurisdictions that do not um, uh, enforce the regulation and that do not impose the travel rule and all the other regulation, which can actually create a safer global environment. In addition, the U.S. could also choose and go and sanction or designate particular exchange platforms that are using, being used, in fact, for terrorism and, and um, uh, criminals as like mixers because they do not um, uh, fully support the, or fully conduct the KYC that is required. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Agnew, Senator uh, Warner of Virginia is recognized. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for holding this uh, critical hearing. Um, I've got to say to my friend, uh, Senator Haggerty, and, and I know another advocate, Senator Loomis, um, around the areas of, of crypto, I'm, I, I believe strongly in the value of dis decentralized ledger. But I do think, and I see more of this, frankly, from a classified setting as chairman of the Intelligence Committee that unfortunately crypto is being used in a, um, in a disproportionate way, I think particularly around rogue regimes like North Korea. And I think one of the things that really ought to be incumbent upon me and others on the intel side to, to get more of this information declassified so we can at least have more facts out there um, on, the, on this subject matter. Um, and I do think there's been some documentation. I think there will be more coming out about literally some of the, uh, some of the payments to Hamas being made uh, through crypto. Uh, it is one of the reasons why a lot of us on the committee in a bipartisan way uh, worked for years literally on the Anti-Money Laundering Act that was uh, three plus years ago. It took a lot of time. Mike Crapo was, was very active. The chair was very active. And the implementation of that bill is still being, unfortunately, too far. Too, too, um, too slow. Uh, it's one of the reasons why recently I've been working with um, Senator Reid and Senator Rounds, Senator Romney on a Senate Bill 2355, the CANSI Act, which actually goes and tries to put a, um, a, a definitional approach um, and some responsibility around DeFi. I, I do not accept, just as a commentary, I do not accept the premise that uh, uh, there is no father or mother of any DeFi system. Somebody is making money off of that, and um, we, try to, we try to grapple on that. That's why, more recently, we've been taking some of the ideas around DeFi and um, also thinking about secondary sanctions, particularly when it comes to terrorist organizations. And what we've used as a template, and I'm going to come come to you, Mr. Levitt, in a moment, is we've actually passed a law in this area. It was back in 2015, uh, we passed a secondary sanctions law against, um, against Hezbollah uh, using traditional areas uh, around banking sections because 2015 there was no part of the crypto, uh, crypto industry. I'm still working with Je um, Senator Reid as well on a bill that would apply secondary sanctions, restrictions on transactions with foreign parties who facilitate uh, transactions with terror, terrorist organizations, um, and not just the, using traditional financial tools, banks, but also using crypto. Um, this- What the hell? <laughs> was that a commentary from- uh, you will have a chance to rebut my, my question in a moment, whoever was making those comments. Um, under our bill, using the Hezbollah bill as a baseline, using our definition of DeFi, and under this bill, Treasury must identify any foreign bank or foreign cryptocurrency entity, which we've called a digital asset transaction, transaction facilitator, known as an FTO, um, so that there would be then secondary sanctions placed on these entities, whether they be traditional banks or these FTOs. Again, as I said, we would in, include using uh, the definitions we had on DeFi from Kansas. So let me actually get to the question and, and 
my last minute, Dr. Levitt, in your testimony, you cite the Hezbollah International Financing Production Prevention Act and said it's a long time past that we go below, beyond Hezbollah to cover these other foreign terrorist organizations. This approach that would both build on the Hezbollah Act, take on foreign terrorist organizations, include their usage not only of traditional financial tools, but of crypto with a DeFi definition included, would this make some sense or not? Tremendous sense and long overdue. The terrorists are still using banks, but they're using other methods too. And while I think that the Wall Street Journal figure is probably exaggerated, there's no question. We've seen DOJ action targeting Hamas crypto and other actions. The Israelis took an action just the, just the other day. Um, this is a growth area. And so we need to try and get, I don't know if it's still safe to say ahead or maybe catch up, on crypto and DeFi and recognize that this is a space where legitimate transactions can happen and illegitimate transactions can happen. And what you are proposing to me makes tremendous sense. And I appreciate, Mr. Chairman, that I know you and your staff are working on this as well. Hopefully we can combine efforts. And frankly, to the, my colleagues who have been strong advocates of crypto, I think if we can decrease the illicit use, uh, particularly terrorist organizations like Hamas, and add that secondary sanction in, it might bring actually um, more legitimacy to this uh, form of transaction wherever they're located in the world. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, um, Senator Warner. And the, the uses of crypto on child trafficking and, and uh, drug running and all of that and understanding it better. Thank you. Senator Lemus of, of Wyoming is recognized. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm so glad we're having this discussion, and I agree with um, Senator Warner. This is an area where crypto is being used to finance terrorism, and we have to provide the tools necessary to stop that. In fact, earlier this year, I worked with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to add an amendment to the NDAA uh, that would require examination standards for crypto asset intermediaries and request a report from FinCEN on mixers and tumblers, the way that information is scrambled to uh, prevent uh, detection. Furthermore, um, let's get after Binance and Tether. These are offshore companies uh, that are financing illicit uh, activities and terrorism. Um, we've got to prevent Hamas, Hezbollah, and other terrorist organizations from using digital assets, using cryptocurrency as a means to finance their activities. Uh, so mixed in with the talk of stronger sanctions on Iran and other avenues to prevent the flow of illicit finance, we've heard a lot about crypto assets today. We should be hearing a lot about crypto assets today. I think it's because our panel is in part missing the perspective of FinCEN and the law enforcement agencies that are actively fighting the finance of terrorism. When we ask FinCEN and others what authorities they need to combat illicit finance and crypto assets, they say they don't need more laws, they need more resources. I've heard from law enforcement that in many ways crypto assets are more traceable than cash. In fact, we've had people testify under oath in this committee that crypto assets are easier to trace than cash because the data is permanently available for everyone to see on a distributed ledger. If you want to download on a computer the entire distributed ledger of Bitcoin, you can do it in your office. It'll take you plug in a computer, sign on, take you about 100 hours, you can download the entire distributed ledger of uh, Bitcoin from day one in 2009 currently, and it'll update every 10 minutes. It, it's, it's remarkable, the information that's available there. So what we need to do is give FinCEN and our regulators the resources to carry out the mission. Now, we address this in the Responsible Financial Innovation Act that uh, Senator Kirsten Gillibrand of New York and I uh, have sponsored. It's a comprehensive framework for digital asset regulation. It provides these resources. As a starting point, it gives FinCEN $150 million to carry out its mission in regard to crypto assets and provides the flexibility to hire and retain highly qualified individuals. 
Now, let's turn for a minute to intermediaries like Binance and Tether. We know that Hamas and other terrorist groups have, on literally hundreds of occasions, been able to open accounts with Binance even after public reporting about the issue. Binance is knowingly facilitating violations of sanction laws and the Bank Secrecy Act by failing to carry out adequate customer screening when it is aware the exchange is being used to finance terrorism. It is also well known that Tether is a favored on and off ramp for illicit activities to interact with CRISPR. Uh, crypto asset markets and is knowingly facilitating violations of the law. It was recently reported that Israeli law enforcement directed Tether to freeze 32 addresses controlled by Hamas and Russian-linked entities in Israel and Ukraine. Tether is failing to conduct adequate consumer and customer due diligence and screening despite being aware that its product is used to facilitate terrorism and other illicit activities. That's why today I sent a letter with um, Representative French Hill, who's the chairman of the House Digital Assets Subcommittee, to Attorney General Merrick Garland asking the Department of Justice to wrap up its investigation and consider criminal charges against Binance and Tether for their involvement in illicit finance. And we now know, as Senator Haggerty noted, uh, that the role of crypto assets in funding Hamas has been overstated. But even one dollar going to support the recent heinous attacks is too much. Binance and Tether have knowingly been allowing terrorists to move funds using their unregulated exchanges. Um, they're based in the Seychelles, in uh, the Caymans, uh, in the British Virgin Islands. It's time they're brought to justice. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent that my letter to Attorney General Garland be entered into the record. Objection, so ordered. We've tried the status quo where crypto asset intermediaries operate in an environment without clear paths to registration. As policymakers, we need to be making it more difficult to operate a crypto asset intermediary in the shadows offshore. But we also need to make it possible to operate a compliant exchange in the United States. By providing robust regulation, the United States can force bad actors out of the crypto asset space and ensure financial innovation can continue in our nation in a manner that does not allow illicit finance to occur. Um, I've used up my time and more so, uh, so I don't have any questions for you. But Mr. Chairman, thank you kindly uh, for holding this hearing. I, I yield back. Thank you, Senator Lewis, for your comments. Um, Senator Smith of Minnesota is recognized from her office. Thank you very much, Chair Brown, and thanks to our panelists for um, being with us today. So, and can we? Just over two weeks ago, this brutal terrorist organization, Hamas, perpetrated a vicious attack on Israel, murdering 1,400 civilians and taking over 200 hostages, most of whom are still being held in unknown conditions. And I, I know that everybody on this committee and in our country has been horrified and heartbroken at the devastation and terror and violence um, that unfolded on that day and that has since unfolded. Um, I agree with the Biden administration that the United States must stand with Israel as it defends itself against this existential threat posed by Hamas. And we also need to work with Israel and all of our regional partners to address the humanitarian crisis in Gaza and minimize further harm to innocent civilians. So my question, I, I want to ask a question to you, Mr. Levitt. Um, the mission to stop Hamas must include cutting off their access to financial resources. And it seems to me that we need to focus not just on what they have done in the past to raise money, but what they will do next, that we need to look forward and be proactive. Um, for example, this past April, Hamas stopped soliciting donations in Bitcoin because of enforcement actions taken against their donors and, and instead are now moved to other leveraging other digital assets and technology. And to be clear, I heard the important testimony earlier that what goes on in crypto is a small portion of what it is that we need to do to um, uh, 
stop the flow of money to um, this terrorist organization. But Mr. Levitt, could you talk about how, as we work with our international partners to cut off Hamas access to financing um, through crypto and other means, how can we be more forward looking? How can we anticipate what their next strategies are gonna be um, uh, to, as, we, as we go forward? Thank you so much for the question. When I was in government, we used to do this all the time. Look at what we did now and try and anticipate how our adversaries would react because they're not just gonna stop. As Hamas is defeated in the Gaza Strip and it can't raise money through governance, it's gonna rely more on Iran. It's likely gonna try and move more towards crypto, though probably not in big numbers. It's definitely gonna try and rely more on abusive charity. In the wake yeah. of this war that Hamas brought on, starting with their slaughter on August 7th, there's lots of suffering. And you'll have good people raising money to help uh, innocents, and you'll have bad people who are using this as a pretext, saying they're raising money for, for innocents when they're really raising money for Hamas. And we've said, or, as I've written in my testimony, we've already seen just in the past few weeks since the attack, uh, no, in some cases, des previously designated entities ratcheting up their fundraising, crowdsourcing, and uh, quote-unquote uh, charitable campaigns. I also applaud the Treasury Department's focus, now a third tranche just this week, on Hamas's finance and investment committees, which have successfully raised hundreds of millions of dollars for Hamas, so it's important to note that it's not liquid cash. It's, it's held mm -hmm. up in investments. Mm -hmm. So following up on that, we know that terrorist organizations exploit charity and the suffering of innocent people for their own um, evil purposes. Do you, are, are there best practices or things that Americans should know if they are seeking to, um, um, to, to, to be to participate in the humanitarian needs that are unfolding by these innocent, you know, with, for these innocent civilians in Gaza who are not Hamas and are not supporting Hamas? Are there, is there anything that people should, you know, to Americans out there should be thinking about as they're wondering what they can do to help? Absolutely. And here again, I applaud Treasury's FinCEN uh, just the other day, uh, issuing an alert to financial institutions to counter Hamas financing. Among the several red flags they highlighted were indicators focused on charitable giving to help detect, prevent, and report suspicious activities related to abuse of charity. So we need to communicate to the public the type of things to look for, and Treasury just did that the other day. Thank you. And, and um, I just have a couple of minutes left, but... Um, you know, we know that Hamas has solicited, has, excuse me, has solicited donations through various social media platforms, um, posting addresses and so forth. And while many platforms have banned um, Hamas, accounts aligned with Hamas continue to emerge. And so I'm wondering what responsibilities do we think that these platforms bear for facilitating such payments? Um, are there, you know, for example, Mr. Levitt X, has recently started boosting content from paid verified users and has adopted this arrangement to share revenues. H how concerned sh should we be with, with this kind of um, activity? I'm very concerned by it. I am very concerned that we don't hold platforms sufficiently responsible for the real life consequences of what they allow on their platforms, whether or not they then monetize that on top of it. And if right. you uh, look at what the platforms have been doing the past few weeks, it's just disgusting. If you want to change the outcomes, you have to change the incentives. And I think the incentives are all wrong there. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Smith. Uh, Senator Daines of Montana is recognized. Chairman Brown, thank you. Uh, five weeks before the October 7th terror attack in Israel, I was in the Hezbollah terror tunnels on the border of Lebanon, um, seeing it firsthand, descending 80 feet down with IDF uh, soldiers. and. Uh, the next day, I met with Prime Minister Netanyahu in Jerusalem. I was the last U.S. Senator, I believe, to meet with Bibi prior to the attack. And we talked about three things. Iran, Hamas, and Hezbollah. It's been very clear to many of us, including clear to many leaders in Israel, that the appeasement strategy of the Biden administration is a failed policy. It's not only failed, it's also dangerous. The maximum pressure campaign against the Iranians is the right policy position to take. And I will just tell you, I speak for many who have been very disappointed for this administration's kind of standing back 
on declaring the linkages between Iran, Hezbollah, Hamas, as well as the Houthis in Yemen. I mean, good grief, you've got the USS Crane and the Red Sea shooting down cruise missiles and drones this moment. This is a shooting war, and the U.S. is involved in this at this moment. And all three of these groups, I mean, two being Shiites with the, with the Houthis and Hezbollah, Sunnis with Hamas, um, I hope this administration will develop moral clarity at this moment in history. It's a dangerous moment. It's a dangerous moment that we hope and pray does not escalate. But this appeasement strategy, starting with JCPOA, with the Iranians, leading to unleashing billions of dollars to Iran, is absolutely failed. And not only has it failed, it is a threat to the stability of the entire world. We all know that Iranian funds flow into illicit finance networks that directly support Hezbollah, Hamas, the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, and other terror networks across the world. And much of this support, Iran's support, is derived from oil exports. The Biden administration has irresponsibly relaxed the sanctions in the enforcement on these Iranian oil exports, resulting in a massive windfall for the regime in Tehran. The regime in Tehran calls out death to America. They call us the big Satan and Israel the little Satan. And yet this administration is rewarding that with billions of dollars through relaxed sanctions relating to oil exports. Estimates place the revenue of Iranian oil exports under the Biden administration between 80 and 90 billion dollars. These rockets, these missiles, the other arms these terrorists have, have to be funded somewhere. And they're coming from Iran. And why can't the administration be clear on that and move away from trying to bring Iran to the table and instead bring Iran to its knees through maximum pressure campaign? To make matters worse, the Biden administration was committed to providing Iran yet another $6 billion at a time when the state of Israel is under attack by Iranian-backed proxies, it's unthinkable, unthinkable that an American president would even consider the idea of letting billions of dollars find their way into the hands of terrorists. While those funds have now reluctantly been refrozen, there's currently nothing stopping the administration from seeking to reinstate this unconscionable policy. And that's why I've introduced legislation that would repurpose that $6 billion. And instead of giving it to Iran, why don't we repurpose it and give that $6 billion for the defense of Israel? Ms. Plekka, it seems the biggest opportunity to impact Iran's financing of Hamas and Hezbollah is directly linked to the enforcement of Iranian oil sanctions. OFAC maintains a sanctions evaders list. This list only has one entity on it. Do you believe that this list is being used to its full potential? And how can we better use it to disrupt Iran's oil exports? Uh, no, I don't believe the list is being used to its full potential. Uh, there's no question that uh, there's no question that the administration needs to both widen its aperture on who to sanction, but also to uh, but also to step up its enforcement. And when I say step up, I really mean transform their attitude towards enforcement so that Iran is not able to earn the revenues that it has been earning so that it doesn't have the windfall that it has had over the last two and a half years because that and only that is going to be a message to them that we are more serious about their financing of terror. Thank you. You used the word change your attitude. I just called a a 180 degree change in their <laughs> foreign policy relates to Iran in terms of moving away from an appeasement strategy, which is very, very dangerous and gets increasingly more dangerous every day that goes by as we watch what's happening around before our very eyes in the Middle East. Dr. Levitt, you host a podcast titled Breaking Hezbollah's Golden Rule. Uh, please answer, ask question quickly. Okay. And if your qu answer, would, we've been called to vote 15 minutes ago, so okay. thank you. Thank Senator you, Chairman. Dance. I'll cut right to this. The, their, their golden rule is the less you know, the better from Hezbollah. In your opinion, what does the U.S. need to do to better attack illicit financial flows from bad actors like Mohammed, Kaser, Alumix, or other fronts owned by Hezbollah family members? And we need a quick answer, and it's my fault, not yours. 
Yeah, there's a lot more that has to be done, but I do think, uh, per the title of the podcast, a lot of it is exposing it and making it public in part so that the financial system, the financial community knows how to follow up. But there's a lot more to do, and I'll, I'll pause because of the time. Yeah, that's my fault. Thank, 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 thank you. Thank you, Senator Daines. Uh, Senator Van Hollen of Maryland. Uh, thank, you. Nice. thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank all of you for your, your testimony today. Uh, Dr. Levitt, in your opening uh, remarks, uh, you made the important distinction between the, the sources of Hamas funding and the transfer of uh, those funds and wanted to spend more time on the transfer issue. I know it's been covered a little bit, but can you talk about that network um, and what more we can do uh, to confront it? Thank you so much for the question, and not only because I'm your constituent. Um, it's very important to stop as much funds as possible. We'll never drain the swamp, and so we need to also look at how they're moving the money. If someone had, bad guy has money in point A but can't get it to point B, I'll, I'll take that as a win. We have not been doing enough there. It also applies not only to money but to other resources. All the weapons that we saw in the Gaza Strip just now, that came from someplace. There's a lot more that can be done on trade-based money laundering. There's a lot more that can be done on cash couriers. We know, FinCEN just informed this week, that Hamas has been transferring money through Hezbollah-affiliated banks. This is low-hanging fruit, and we have opportunities now. And by we, I don't only mean the United States. Sanctions diplomacy by the United States can get buy-in from our allies in Europe and elsewhere, and now is the time. If the heinous attack of October the 7th doesn't push people to act, I don't know what will. Right. So, and, and the major tool that you're suggesting uh, in that regard are the secondary sanctions on Hamas. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. And um, when it comes to FinCEN, uh, we, we, the United States, has been asking them to do a lot more uh, in a short period of time. I chair the Appropriations uh, Subcommittee that oversees uh, the Treasury and funding for that. I, I hope, actually, as part of one of the supplementals uh, we deal with, emergency supplemental, we increase uh, funds for FinCEN. And I, I think all the issues that you're, you're talking about uh, here are, are part of that. Dr. Wagman, uh, you've had experience um, you know, through the Israeli efforts uh, it, to crack down on these money launderings. What lessons uh, have you learned that could be helpful to us in terms of the transfer? Thanks uh, for the question. Actually, there are many things that could still be done. First of all, international collaboration and cooperation. There is not enough of it. Um, like the ransomware mechanism that was established, 24-7 respond, I think that it's very important to disrupt terrorism. Second, to make sure that sanctions are being enforced. Sanction and secondary sanction. We still see, as was mentioned here before, low-hanging fruits. Uh, Turkey um, um, uh, still... Uh, being a major channel to accept those funds. We see that, uh, you know, Hezbollah and, and Hamas and, and the trade base, there are still many areas that we could do much more. In addition, to make sure that law enforcement have the right capabilities and resources, as you rightfully mentioned, um, and with respect to FinCEN, perhaps to add to their authorities also the suspension, the temporary uh, freezing, uh, something that is common and exists in Europe that does that is in particular relevant to, uh, to disp disturb uh, terrorism financing. Um, um, so this is uh, some of the sources, and also I think that the U.S. could actually, through the international organizations such as FADEF, could actually promote um, international response to, to those actions. No, I appreciate those lessons learned, and um, the, the putting the fund on pause, this is an authority that the fin FinCEN does not currently have, is that, okay, and we look forward to pursuing that. Um, just in, in closing, uh, Dr. Levitt, and I only raise this question because uh, Senator Kennedy made some uh, remarks uh, about, for example, uh, transfers uh, from the Qataris, the transfer from the PA. Uh, I think you're well aware of the fact those transfers took place with the concurrence of the, the Israeli government and, and Prime Minister Netanyahu earlier on. Isn't that right? It is right. The Israelis wanted stability and quiet, thinking that would buy... Uh, uh, deterrence and calm. Unfortunately, that's been proven wrong, but it was the policy. It was the U.S. policy as well. Right. And, and so I just think it's important because we've heard that a couple times today. We want to get after all the illicit financing, but just to be clear, those transfers were done with the concurrence of both the United States uh, and Israel, right? Yes, sir. Okay. And, and in fact, uh, there's been much written about how part of Prime Minister Netanyahu's um, motivations at the time actually were to uh, pre prevent um, the Palestinian Authority uh, from gaining in, in greater legitimacy. It was a, I'm sure you're aware of different uh, things that have been written. What is, what is your sense of what the motivation for this was? I'll leave Israeli domestic politics aside. I think across Israeli administrations, 
it was a clear policy to try and keep the calm. And the way to keep the calm was to make sure that there was at least enough economic activity in Gaza. The week before this attack, the Netanyahu government, that government increased the number of Gazans who were going to be allowed into Israel to work. So th this was the policy to, 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 to buy calm at the time. And everyone was caught off guard and everyone was found wrong on, on all sides of the partisan divide. Got it. Th thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Senator Van Hollen. Senator uh, Warren of Massachusetts is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On October 7th, Hamas militants killed 1,400 people and took more than 200 hostages. So where did they get the money to outfit their fighters with guns and rockets and radios? I mean, after all, Hamas is already one of the world's most heavily sanctioned organizations. That means that the traditional channels for the global movement of money are largely closed off to them. Any money laundering rules that banks, gold traders, stockbrokers all follow make it hard to finance terrorism. But terrorists have found ways around those rules. One big one, crypto. Dr. Levitt, as a Treasury official, you saw firsthand how terrorists structure their transactions to evade detection. Recent reporting has suggested that Hamas and Islamic Jihad linked crypto wallets identified in seizure orders by the Israeli government received an estimated $134 million in two and a half years leading up to the attacks. So here's my question. Do you think that government authorities know the full extent of all the crypto funds that Hamas and Islamic Jihad received over that time period? By definition, they can't know all of the, uh, the extent of it. But I do think that number is very likely exaggerated. It's happening. They're getting money through crypto. There's no question. But the experts who follow this closely think that number is inflated. So you think that they don't know all of the transactions that are occurring? So there are more transactions that are just out there in the dark. And I take it no real way to estimate how big or how small they are? Because, it, you know, it's not anonymous, but you have to be able to put a long set of numbers to a person's name. And because of that, it can be complicated. Most of this is not ending up in an account of Hamas Incorporated or Islamic Jihad Incorporated. By definition, because this is still an emerging uh, technology and we are all catching up with it, we are behind, I can't imagine anybody sitting in front of you and saying, yeah, we know the full scope of it. Okay, this. fair enough. So uh, the reason that conclusion is so important is because crypto industry players acknowledge that Hamas was financing itself through crypto, but they claim that the terrorist organization, and I'm going to quote them, stopped soliciting crypto donations because they were traceable. Now, obviously, the industry's claim is false. In fact, just last week, the head of cyber defense division of Israel's National Cyber Defense Directorate said, and I quote, in this period of war, cryptocurrency is a major issue for financing terror because there are no other options, and that the amount of crypto flowing to terrorist groups has, quote, super increased since the attack began. Now, Senator Marshall and I, along with 14 of our Senate colleagues, including Senator Cortez Masto, Senator Smith, and Senator Fetterman, right here on the Banking Committee, believe that Congress has talked about the threat of illicit crypto finance for long, ago, for long enough, and now it's time for Congress to act. We have a bill called the Digital Asset Anti-Money Laundering Act, which closes loopholes in our anti-money laundering and anti-terrorism financing, or AML-CFT rules, and cuts off terrorists and other criminals from using crypto to fund their illegal activities. Dr. Wagman, you were the Director General of the Israel Money Laundering and Terrorism Financing Prohibition Authority. Last year, you wrote that, quote, in their attempt to avoid being traced, illegal actors have adopted ever more sophisticated cryptocurrency technologies, such as non-custodial wallets. You wrote that Hamas uses non-custodial wallets to evade detection. Do those wallets pose a particularly high risk of attracting terrorists and other very dangerous people? Thank you for the question. 
Uh, it is important, uh, perhaps if I may, just to refer to your earlier comments about the funding of Hamas. Uh, the major funding of Hamas, unfortunately, the, the current sanctuary regime is far from being sufficient. And most of its budget and funds are still going through the traditional channels. And I want to put that clear because crypto is a problem, but this is not the major problem. And we have to look, you know, on other traditional channels like banking and, and exchanges and money exchanges and cash and so forth. So let's not forget that. Having said that, uh, crypto, uh, it is a technology like any other technology could, could, that could be used for legitimate and illegitimate purposes. We do see an, uh, um, uh, trends on both sides. As long as we are able to create a framework of compliance into those systems, we are able to create environments in which we could trust some of the transactions that are going there, even most of them, when the platform is compliant. Therefore, I think that it is really important to make sure going forward that we're creating those environments that we could actually inspect and put uh, forward the relevant technologies to ensure compliance. Okay, so I appreciate that. Okay, I'll be really quick. I just want to point out, you wrote that decentralized finance and peer-to-peer -peer transactions between unhosted wallets are, quote, higher risk structures. Two days ago, the Treasury Department wrote to lawmakers here Quote, there are steps that Congress could take that would bolster Treasury's resources and authorities to combat both terrorist financing and mitigate illicit finance risks posed by virtual ICE assets. Hamas is using crypto to help finance terrorism. Our current laws are inadequate. We have the power to choke off that lifeline, and I think that's what we should do. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Mr. Senator Chairman. Senator Warnock of Georgia is recognized. Thank you very much, Chair Brown. Uh, the heinous acts of terrorism committed by Hamas were horrific and are rightly condemned by all who believe in human dignity and seek a lasting peace. What these events make clear is that there are those who are afraid of peace and they seek to sabotage it at any cost. We must not let them win and we must recommit ourselves to the hard work of a lasting peace grounded in justice and in human dignity for all of God's children, both our Israeli and Palestinian brothers and sisters. Shortly after the terrorist attack in Israel, I joined Senators Warren, Marshall, and many on this committee in urging uh, Treasury to immediately investigate and halt the illicit usage of cryptocurrency by Hamas, by Hezbollah, and other terrorist groups for money laundering and financing of their terrorist operations. I'm glad that Treasury has made some moves here to clamp down on some of the crypto technologies being utilized by Hamas, but the threat uh, does persist. There is debate and conversation here that's very helpful about the extent of the threat, uh, but I think there's agreement that, th that the threat persists. Uh, Dr. Wagman, why are cryptocurrencies apparently a method of choice for these terrorist groups to transfer funds, and are these factors intrinsic to crypto? So yeah, um, um, crypto uh, does have um, 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 uh, advantages for um, uh, illicit counterparts to work in uh, because the um, uh, KYC or the compliant environment at least used to be uh, lower than the, financial, the other financial system. And this is why they were using that. Um, I do think that I mean, the technology is there whether we like it or not. And this is it's really important to look forward and make, to, to continue our process and make sure that we're creating environments that are secure enough. And even when we're getting to DeFi and all other technologies, there is a way, there is a technology that could also inspect that. And because of everything is transparent on the blockchain, we, choose, we should focus our efforts on how to make sure that we have uh, the ability to uh, designate bad actors, and we see many exchange flat platforms that are working under um, uh, countries which do not enforce the AML CFT regulation that was adopted by the international regu um, uh, regu regulators, and there are countries that do impose that. And we see differentiation in the way that terrorists uh, are using those platforms. In the uh, supervised and compliant uh, platforms, there is less use. So I would suggest to put our efforts on making sure that we are sanctioning and supervising the unlicensed uh, um, or the, those that are not compliant in order to reduce the activity there, and also to ensure that we have better monitoring tools to, to, to continue to supervise that. Uh, we, we have seen the ways in which crypto has been proven to be widely used by criminals and terrorists 
the world over, even executives at Binance, the largest crypto exchange in the world, are accused by the CFTC of being seemingly dismissive of the risk that Hamas is utilizing their platform to fund terrorism. And authorities have closed over 100 accounts linked just to Hamas on Binance since Hamas's attack on Israel. Dr. Levitt, what considerations do you make when examining the use of crypto in financing these terror groups? Like Shlomit, I'm concerned about the ability not only to raise funds but to move funds as a means of transfer because of the nature of there, there are no borders. And so as we crack down on other means of Hamas financing, they're going to you know, squeeze that balloon, it'll expand elsewhere. And so while I don't think that Hamas has made tremendous amounts of money by crypto, I am concerned that it is a growing industry. It is a place where they will try to expand their opportunities. And so it's something we have an opportunity now. I don't know if we can say get ahead, but to, to hurry up and catch up and prevent it from becoming something big before it does. Thank you so much. I look forward to working with my colleagues to find ways of clamping down on this issue and uh, uh, making sure that we're not uh, making it easy for these groups like Hamas uh, to finance their, their awful crimes against humanity. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Warnock. Senator Fetterman of Pennsylvania is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's, thank you for all being here today, uh, experts. And it's always a treat to be here when I'm able to talk to people much smarter than I am. And this last time I was in this very same chair, we were talking about crypto. And I asked the experts and I said, uh, a couple questions, and they were kind of fundamental. Is like, and I just want to ask you as well too, as experts, um, should crypto exist? In other words, is you know where should it exist? Like, you know, why should it endure? If anyone has any answers. Uh, happy to assist. Actually, that's the exact question that I was asked by the Ministry of Finance uh, in Israel a couple of uh, years ago. And he asked me, you know what, let's just outlaw everything, uh, you know, this entire crypto. I, I, it, it's going to be used for bad purposes. And I told him, Mr. Minister, unfortunately, the technology is out there. So it's not a question whether you like it or not. You need to manage the risk and find the ways to actually supervise that and make sure that it will be compliant. So there are good uses of crypto, um, financial inclusion, and, and many others. At the same time, we have to be very strict to make sure that the legislative framework is addressing the concerns that we have. We have to make sure that all platforms are compliant, that we have very clear rules, that all countries are enforcing them in a similar manner, and that we are not letting other countries to get off the hook and actually encourage environment in which bad actors can, can, uh, can work. We could create, together with the FATF, a gray list of those countries and make sure that they are uh, publicly uh, announce and then we'll have better, you know, in addition to other tools, we'll have better way to monitor what's going on there rather than just, you know, assume that it doesn't happen. Yeah, and so, so where does the value assigned to crypto come from? Where does it come from? Because it's really just a mathematical idea, you know, kind of for me feels like it's a gimmick, but, you know, where does the value of that come from other than there's not somebody kind of <laughs> less informed they, that I will, I'll pay more than what you just you know bought it for. So anyone have any thoughts on that? Well, I can answer again. I mean, there are some rationale of you know, having a more uh, decentralized economy and, and theories behind that. Um, but, but I mean, at the end of the day, I think that this discussion, even if it was relevant a couple of years ago, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter anymore because the technology is there and it's not something that is possible now, you know, to, to decide. People, I mean, enough people think that there is value and they're spending the money on it. And of course, illicit actors are using that as well. No doubt about it. Um, so I think that the major challenge that we should focus on our energy on is how to make sure that their options are being um, uh, smaller and that we're closing the gaps as much as possible uh, these days. So, so let me ask you, why didn't Hamas use its American Express card to finance that awful terrorist? Why, why? Why wouldn't they use their Amex or, or PayPal? So actually, they are using bank accounts and, um, and credit cards and uh, payment uh, cards. I know that firsthand because many Israelis are now monitoring all, you know, campaigns and they, they see that. Oh, so it's traceable then, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, no, no. I'm, 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 what, what I just want to say is that, you know, 
crypto, I, I don't want us to fall into the, you know, the, the assumption that crypto will solve everything. Uh, other uh, traditional channels are also being being used. This is all just I want to say. Yeah, well, I was just trying to drill down. It's like, of course, you know, it seems that they used crypto because it's really difficult or impossible to trace. So is, you know, the, the, the bug is the feature, it seems, you know, to me. And if you are able to remove that ability to be anonymous, would crypto even endure? Because to me, it seems like whether you're financing terrorism or purchasing illicit drugs, you know, on the, the, the dark web or other kinds of uh, illegal things, um, no one's doing that, you know, using, you know, uh, Pal, you know, Apple Pay or whatever. They're using crypto. So really, is the one major reason why crypto exists is to finance things that are either illegal or they wouldn't want to be attached to that kind of a thing. Is that a, is that a fair question? I mean, I, I don't want to step up uh, like um, uh, encouraging um, uh, the, the industry because that's, that's not my purpose. But it is important also to mention that because everything here is digital in many aspects, sometimes as law enforcement community, there are better monitoring tools to go on crypto and blockchains rather than cash, for example, because they're always a, um, 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 alternative for that. So we should, I think, you know, focus on our efforts on how to improve the monitoring resources and, and tools that we have, how to impose more compliance and how to differentiate uh, between those environment of legal and illegal activities. And, and there are ways to do that. And once you're putting them aside, we, you could have better things. By the way, there are some cryptocurrencies that you could actually confiscate from afar, from a distance, just by disabling them. So this is something like one of the solutions that uh, some actors from private sector came up with in order to, um, uh, to minimize uh, the, the uh, options to misuse crypto. Um, again, I'm, it's not that I'm supporting the industry, I'm just in a, in a place in which it exists and we have to find a way to deal with it because outloading that altogether just will create a black market that will, will not be able to supervise at all. And that actually, um, I'm, I'm more afraid of than you know, having some monitoring tool and working on improving them and making sure that law enforcement authorities may have the option of doing that. And being realistic because money laundering and terrorism financing happen in many um, 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 platforms. Uh, Mr. Chairman, may I indulge for 30 uh, seconds? Oh, thank you, sir. Um, I, and it's more of a statement where it's like, I, to me, my question is, is like, if you are able to effectively uh, track it or, d d you know, document, you know, it, it, would anybody really use it anymore? You know, like, the, you know, like that, that's really, the, to me, that's what I'm really trying to get to it. And I'm not saying there's an answer. That's why I'm asking the experts. It's like, if you're able to effectively track it, would it really be attractive for anyone to, 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 to traffic in that, especially because how volatile it is. And I really hope Hamas and everyone took a bath in crypto, you know, with, with the rest of everyone else, too. So they got a lot less uh, guns for, for what they used to have, maybe. So we're definitely hearing a lot of uh, use cases in the market of people that are using that, you know, in order to make sure that they are not um, attached to a certain currency, but have uh, something that, you know, is fixed to the dollars, that they want uh, to put their uh, funds um, uh, in places or to transact with lower cost, uh, to have more financial inclusion uh, options. So there are some legitimate use cases for that. And the blockchain technology, generally speaking, has its advantages in the way that it, you know, it's, it's easier to, con to transact around the globe. Thank you, Senator Fetterman. Uh, thank you to the thank panel uh, for being here. Thank you for providing testimony and your responses. Senators who wish to submit questions for the record, those questions are due one week from today, November 2nd. For the witnesses, you have 45 days to respond to those questions. Thank you again. The committee's adjourned.